Thank you, Ashley. Greetings, everyone. Let's just get the ball rolling right into this. <clears throat> for today's presentation, again, as Ashley mentioned, you're here for the Autodesk Inventor Sheet Metal. We're going to cover really the ABCs of starting from your basic sketch, going through some of the feature modeling uh, capabilities, and into flattening and some of the options and controls you have there. Uh, as she mentioned, I have Kevin Bosch running the background Q&A, so let's keep it going. The next slide is obviously for those who cannot hear me, but this is a good visual reference for everybody. Uh, the GoToMeeting Manager that you have on your screen has a questions section, uh, so you can use that to type in your questions and Kevin will address those. We'll also have some time at the end where uh, we'll live address questions, uh, anything that comes through that might be tricky or whatever, uh, we'll get to those at the end. <clears throat> so, starting at the beginning, letter A, sheet metal, what's it used for? Uh, it's used for brackets, various enclosures, boxes, uh, even structural framework, machine framework, product framework. You can have sheet metal doors and lids and caps and close-offs. Uh, again, structural support comes into this a little bit. So it's got a lot of different industries and a lot of different uh, areas it's going to impact. <clears throat> what is it not used for? So sheet metal, it's used for this, but it's not used for that. This is a little hang-up that gets a lot of people who are just coming into sheet metal into a 3D parametric world. And the key note here is your material thickness so with inventor sheet metal you hey, can Kendrid? yes sorry to interrupt but I'm having a few uh, people say they can't hear um, the person can't hear you um, well let's see we could troubleshoot a little I believe there are options on the go to meeting to either use a telephone dial-in or microphone and Speakers. Okay, I'm, I'm getting some feedback that other people can hear, so the other people might want to call in um, okay. using that number. Sorry, thanks. Oh, no, thank you. Sorry, everybody's having some difficulties. <clears throat> so, uh, with the material uh, thickness, what Inventor Sheet Metal Engine can do is it can flatten material that is stretched, but not material that is deformed. So first question comes up, okay, what's the difference? Which one applies? When the material thickness remains constant, the material is going to stretch around a corner or around a bend. Some of your stampings and punches that you use might adhere to this situation. Some may not. It's going to depend on that geometry. That is a material stretch situation. Inventor can flatten that. When you get into material deformation, like a car body stamping, what happens is when the material is pressed, some areas of the material will get thinned down. They'll deform relative to the other surrounding surfaces and the thickness of, of that geometry. So when the material changes thickness, that's a deformation. Um, stampings usually cannot be flattened because of that situation. <clears throat> so looking at these two examples here, uh, on the right, you're seeing a variable thickness situation on the radius, the outside radius and the inside radius. There's too much material there, and it does not match the upper flange or the side flange. On the left, you're seeing the uniform thickness. That's the stretch situation. We can flatten the left, cannot flatten the right. <clears throat> Just wanted to clarify that. So that's sheet metal 101. You can flatten material stretch, but not deformation. So looking at the first steps of sheet metal, one of the areas you're going to go to and set up either in your template or for every model is you're going to look at your sheet metal styles. The styles control your material thickness, bend radii, unfold rules, bend tables, material assignments, corner reliefs. It's a nice little one-stop shop to control everything. Then you're going to look at generating features. You can start with, well, you're going to have to start with sketches, whether you create a face from that sketch or a contour flange from that sketch. From that, you're going to build on additional features, flanges, cutouts, hems, rolling flanges, lofting flanges, 
and then you're going to ultimately generate a flat pattern. That's the whole end game of all this. That's letter Z. You need that flat pattern to send out to your burner to cut out the shape so you can then start flattening it and, or bending it and molding it into the shape you need. <clears throat> so again, the starting point, you're going to set up your defaults. You're going to create your model. You can create a folded model first, such as an enclosure three-sided enclosure you can start with a 3d shape and then you can start ripping out corners and then flatten that or you can start with the flat model you can start with a flat sheet and just start bending so you got both directions you can work with you can also generate sheet metal parts through the context of an assembly they can be disjointed solid models they can be multi-part or multi-solid or multi-body models. There's various terms for that. Uh, you can have a, a standard model and you shell it out much like the three-sided enclosure I mentioned earlier. Or you can even start with a third-party model, something coming out of Pro-E or SolidWorks, and we can flatten that. We don't get any of the feature history as it stands right now, but when we bring in the model, we get the 3D form and we can flatten it. <clears throat> and if we got enough time, I'll uh, show you that. So let's get into all this. All right, so starting out, we've got a little factory layout here, a little environment we're going to work in, and got a couple things going on. Uh, we've got an exhaust system that we're going to have to make a connector piece up here for the fan to connect to and pull the exhaust up. This is a soldering uh, workstation, so we need to pull those fumes away from the worker. Uh, we've got a channel here that we're going to run some electrical wiring through for phone lines, power for the computer, things like that, because there's no outlets in this factory. It's all run from a central location. And we've got a computer tower down here. So when I open the computer tower, we're missing a few things. We've still got some work that, you know, we're a sheet metal fab shop, so we've got some work that we're doing uh, on this custom tower, and we need to make a bracket that's going to hold the CD-ROM bays. <clears throat> so I'm going to start out with a brand new file, and it's a sheet metal file. Now, the whole purpose of this webinar is, one, to give everybody a general overview of sheet metal. Two, for anyone who is interested in sheet metal or new to sheet metal, it's geared to show you the workflow uh, that's going to help you utilize that tool. For the advanced sheet metal users, I'm going to be covering some commands and workflows that you may not even know exist. So I'm trying to cover everybody I can. So there's a little bit of basics in here and a little bit of advanced. So I'll start with a sheet metal file. <clears throat> so right out of the gate, looks like a standard IPT, standard model. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to create a sketch. Just going to sketch on one of my origin planes and sketch out my shape. Now there's various ways I could start out generating this tray. I could start out either with um, a face, so I could sketch this, finish my sketch, and I could generate a sheet metal face and start folding from that. Or I can finish my sketch and invoke the contour flange. So the difference here is face just generates a flat face, a flat sheet based on whatever shape you have sketched out. Whereas the contour flange takes that sketch and essentially it extrudes it. It does a couple of things during that extrude process. When I invoke the contour flange, you'll notice my sketch was just a simple line sketch. There was no wall thickness. So what the sheet metal engine does is when you extrude or make a face or use a contour flange, it reads from the parameters of the sheet metal environment and it sees that sketch profile and it thickens it. It gives it a wall thickness. So if I zoom in here real close, you'll see my sketch line right here inside, kind of darker a little bit. And then you'll see that it's rounding off the corners for me inside and outside corners and it's giving it a thickness. Now you've got control over where that thickness is applied, whether it's an inside offset, an outside offset, or a midway offset. <clears throat> then you simply choose, okay, how far am I going to extrude this, or how far am I going to generate this contour flange? How wide is it going to be? So I'm going to set this up for 110 millimeters. And again, you can control what direction this goes. You can go positive, negative, even though there's not a negative distance, or you can split. You can go 
equal distance on both sides of the sketch. <clears throat> now, in the it doesn't apply in the face command because there are no flanges or anything to work with, but in the contour flange, lofted flange, contour roll, things like that, you have control over the unfold options, the bend, and the corner controls. I'm going to look at these in the sheet metal styles in a moment, but you have essentially three areas where you can control this. So I'll hit OK, got my first contour flange. Let's go look at the sheet metal defaults. When you launch the defaults, typically you're going to have these set up in your template. So I'm using a default sheet metal rule. You can make whatever rules you want. It's pulling the thickness from that sheet metal rule. Your material is, again, based on the rule. The unfold rule is, again, based on the sheet metal rule that you're using. Everything is governed by this one-stop shop. So when I come in here and look at the sheet metal rule, looking at the default rule, for example, I can set my material to be whatever material I want it to be. We'll just say a steel alloy. Specify my thickness. The unfold rule, by default, it's set up to use a K factor. I'll get to that in a moment. Your miters, rips, seam gaps, you'll notice they're all relating back to the thickness control. Everything in sheet metal is going to, by default, relate to that thickness parameter. So whatever you set here, everything builds from that. Either it, it is equal to that thickness or it's a ratio to that thickness or that thickness multiplied by a certain factor. <clears throat> you have control over the flat pattern bend angle, how it's specified, the punch representation on the flat pattern, whether you see a 3D punch or if you see a 2D sketch representation of the punch or a 2D sketch and a center mark, or really what most people want to see is just a center mark. You don't really care about seeing the punch on the flat. You just need to know where to place it. You've already got your tools set up for it. So you've got control over the punch representation, and that's all on the sheet tab. On the bend tab is where you're going to specify your bend relief shape, whether you're using a straight uh, relief shape with relief width, again, notice it relates back to the thickness parameter. Relief depth, same thing, related to the thickness parameter. The minimum remnant or the leftover chunk at the end, your bend radius, and even your corners. On the corners, you can specify two bend transitions. If it's a trimmed bend, a tear, a square, a round, a three, a three bend intersection, how that corner is going to be treated. And I skipped over it accidentally. On the bend tab, you have different styles of relief shapes, a tear shape, a round shape, or a straight cut. So whichever one you want to run with. Set up your parameters or set up your defaults. Save that. You also have control over a sheet metal unfold rule. Now, this works a couple of different ways. By default, Inventor is set up to use a generic K factor. It's kind of a best average for most materials. If you have taken measurements out in your shop and you have determined a different K factor, obviously you can put that in here. <clears throat> you can also utilize a bend compensation, bend compensation form. That's either going to be a custom equation that you can write, which you have tutorials down through here to step you through what needs to be uh, mathematically calculated. You can write the algorithm yourself. You also have a graphical representation of what each variable relates to, relates to, so that helps. Or you could build a bend table. Uh, the way the bend table works is you specify a thickness, we'll say one millimeter, then you specify for whatever bend radius and whatever open angle, the value changes this much. So you've got a couple of different ways to control your bend behavior. In the default rule is where you're controlling globally for your bend relief shape and your corner condition. When you start adding features, you can control it within the feature. So that's what I'm going to do next. I'm actually going to add some flanges around the outer edge. So I'm going to use the flange command and just pick these two edges out here. Now, the basics of the flange command, you're specifying the edges to flange, and you're giving them a length. So I'm going to say 12 millimeters on these guys. 
you can change the height datum, you can change the bend position, you can do a loop of edges, you can flip the direction of the flange. Maybe you picked the edge and it went the wrong way, you can flip it, not a problem. Inside the feature, you have, again, control for the unfold option for that feature. So we've got it specified globally by the defaults or per feature. Then for this entire feature, I could say, on the bend tab, instead of using a default straight, I want to use a tear. Or on the corner tab, instead of using a tear, I want to use a square. That's for this feature only. So both of these flanges covered by one feature. That's the second level of control. The third level is you'll notice out here on each one of the flange corner conditions, you have a tertiary control. <clears throat> so I can pull this up and say, well, for this particular type, you know, change the width or the bend extents, and you can have multiple ways to control how that corner condition behaves, either globally, by feature, or per corner inside the feature. So we've got our first set of flanges out here. I'm going to keep adding more. I'm going to add another flange over to the side. And this one needs to be shorter, doesn't have to be the whole length. So we're going to expand the flange options and we're going to tweak it down from 12 millimeters to 10 millimeters. Down at the bottom, I'm going to change it from an edge control and I'm going to choose an offset. Actually, I'm going to choose a width. I'll choose a width on this one. When you choose width, it defaults to center the flange on the edge that you selected. For this, I don't want it to be centered. I want it to be offset from a particular location. So I'm going to specify that location to be this bottom corner here. That's offsetting at five millimeters. Actually, I don't want it offset any. I'm just going to say a zero offset, but the width of my flange is going to be 25 millimeters. So that gives me a piece of that edge that I can just flange. I don't have to flange the entire thing. <clears throat> I'll apply that, build another flange down here at the other end, choosing the same edge. Again, choosing the width option, offset, it's still going to be 25 millimeters. My offset location is going to be this other end down here. Now, you notice when I choose that point, it's trying to flange off in space. Okay, that's not going to work, obviously. But I can flip that offset to go one edge or the other. So you can control what direction that flange is going to be generated. <clears throat> Two more flanges I need to add out here on the ends. So I add this one out here, and we're actually going to just say extents on that one, so it's going to be the entire edge. And this one is going to be 10 millimeters as well. And the next flange I'm going to add is over here at the other side. This one's not going to be the entire length. It's going to be shortened a little bit, and it's going to be controlled by an offset value. So the way the offset works is you specify two points, and you offset from those points. So maybe you don't know what the overall length of that flange is, but you know it needs to be a certain gap from that edge and a certain gap from that edge. So on the top offset, I'll just pick the very end point up here, it's going to be set to zero, and then on the bottom offset, I'm actually going to set it to be 20 millimeters. And I need to change the overall length of that one to be 12. <clears throat> okay, so our little CD tray is coming along very slowly. But we're getting there. A couple of things we need to do is we need to miter out these corners. So looking at how the flanges have came together, there's an offset non-uniform gap or an overlap. We don't want that overlap because it could interfere with other parts of the computer tower, other areas of the framing. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to actually rip out this corner. So I'm going to use the corner seam tool and that allows you to specify two edges to control, and you can either specify a symmetric gap, an overlap gap, or an offset or a reverse overlap gap. Uh, you can even rip out corners when you're working on a 3D model. So like I mentioned earlier, the uh, three-sided enclosure. If I had that box shape up there, I could just rip out a corner and that would open up that area. <clears throat> so I'm just gonna do a corner seam on each end, and the end result gives you a very nice, clean corner condition. Again, you have control for this feature on the bend control and the corner conditions. Okay, next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to put in some cutouts. 
So I'm going to come back on the back face, sketch a small little cutout piece. And a couple of ways you could do this, okay? You can sketch something from scratch, obviously. Or if you're able to kind of organize your workflow, you can use sketch blocks. So that's what I've done here. I'm just going to place in this particular sketch block. That's the shape that I'm going to cut out. I just need to rotate it around and put it in place where it needs to go. <clears throat> Slide it over and get it basically where it needs to be and just dimension it to locate it. And we'll put it about five millimeters in. Okay, so that's it for my sketch. Now I need to cut this out. Basically what you're going to be doing is an extrude cut, but you'll notice there is no extrude command in the sheet metal tools. It is here on another ribbon, but that's not where you want to be. You want to stick with the sheet metal tools for most applications. Okay, so for this I'm going to use the cut operation. Two different ways this can work. When I choose the profile or the sketch area that I want to cut out, you notice it just does a straight down linear cut and it's cutting to the depth of the thickness. I can change that parameter if I wanted to. If I don't want it cut all the way out, if I'm, if I'm going to machine it out with some kind of die tool or something like that, I can change that. But cutting through the thickness is obviously what I want to hear, want to put in here. So I can either do a straight down cut as it shows or I can tell Inventor cut across the bend. So what that's actually going to do is it's going to take this sketch profile and it's going to wrap it around that corner bend and keep cutting into the sidewall. That's what I want to do. That's going to give me my cutout for my tabs, my screw tabs for the CD-ROM to go in there and be held down and secured. So I'll click OK and it gives me that cutout that wraps around the back wall. Now next thing I need to put in another one of these, I'm not going to repeat that process. I'll just cheat and use a pattern. So I'll just do a rectangular pattern over about 42 millimeters the other way. So now I've got both my cutouts back there for both drive trays. A few more features coming along on this guy. Uh, we've got a tab cutout we need to put in the top here. Nothing special, just a basic, basic rectangular shape. And just dimension to locate that. And one final offset dimension in here. And again, another cut, just a straight line cut. Don't have to worry about cutting across the bends. It just cuts out that area. Something else that a lot of users don't realize, whether you're in sheet metal or standard part modeling, we get into a bad habit of having one sketch per feature. One feature, one sketch. For the most part, that works, but there is a way of streamlining, especially in sheet metal, so that you can organize and have all of your cutouts in one sketch, and you just reuse that sketch. So that's what I'm going to do here. I've got a couple of things, just basic um, shapes that I need to sketch out first and locate, but I'm going to use this one sketch to generate multiple cuts. Locate from the outer edge of this guy. And again, in the sketch, I'm going to utilize some sketch blocks. Best practice would be to have these built into your templates, but if you don't, you can always copy them from another drawing or another part or another sketch and paste them into this one. So I'll just place that block in here. I need two of these guys. And I just need to rotate them to the proper orientation. Relax any sketch constraints that may be built in. And then just dimension to locate them. So I'm going to line them up with each other. Put in just a couple of locator dimensions. We'll say, I think, 25 down to the centers. the wrong thing. One more. There we go. <clears throat> and it needs to be located down from the top. 15. And then lastly, over from the side. Tw 
12. Okay, one final sketch block I'm going to throw in here. It's a small oval shape. Same thing here, just rotate it to the proper orientation and dimension it to locate it. Get down there. And we got to dimension this guy over from that edge and up from the bottom. And that'll take care of that. So I'll finish this sketch and build my next cut. So my first cut operation is I'm going to cut out that rectangular shape kind of in the center. And I'll click OK. Now, what happens is when you consume a sketch, it the visibility of that sketch gets turned off. It gets nested under that feature in the tree. OK, basic parametric modeling workflow. A lot of people don't realize that you can reuse this sketch simply by right clicking on it, turning on the visibility that brings that geometry back out to where the features can select it. So now I can reuse that and generate all of these cuts either in individual features or in one giant feature, whichever way I want to do this, and then just come over here and turn the visibility of my sketch back off. I don't need it anymore. <clears throat> so especially in the sheet metal world, organizing your cut profiles in one sketch, if you can do it, especially on the same face, if you can do it that way, it streamlines the overall process. Just like we did before, I'm just going to generate a quick rectangular pattern to get these down here, that's the screw holes and mounts and alignment tabs for my CD-ROM drives. Next, I need to put a very small flange. So in case you haven't seen it yet, this is the orientation that the bracket's going to slide into the PC. So there needs to be a very small landing flange right here that's going to basically carry the CD-ROM until we get the, the top CD-ROM, until we get some screws uh, placed in it doesn't have to be very large, just a little five millimeter flange is enough to carry it. <clears throat> Lastly, we need a couple of hems. So you can generate flanges, you can generate contour flanges, you can also generate hems, which allows you to simply take an edge and fold it over. You've got a couple of different types of hems that you can choose from, a single hem, teardrop shape, a rolled or a double rolled. For each one of these, they all tie back into that thickness parameter that I mentioned earlier. They are simply a multiplier of that parameter. Now, if you don't want to use form factors, you don't want to use multiple no, multipliers, you can just say, well, let's extend this thing down 12 millimeters. You know, whatever value you want to put, put in, you can do that just by plugging in the numerical value. Or you can even change the equation if you want to. So I think this was thickness times 0.5, if I remember correctly. So I'm going to put in a hem, and you can choose to hem the entire edge, or just like the flange command, you can expand that, and you can have controls over how much of that edge gets the hem feature. For this one, it's going to be an offset. It's going to be 5 millimeters from each end. It already has the end selected. I don't really have to do anything. That's going to be the case on all three edges. So very quickly, just apply those hems, and I'm done. That has my completed, flip it around, that has my completed CD-ROM bracket. What's the ultimate goal when you're working with sheet metal? To get a flat. So we've got the 3D model. A lot of people will think, okay, well, now we've got to go out and we've got to create a drawing, and you may put down, say, an ISO shaded, of the 3D, just, you know, nice picture worth a thousand words to help somebody see how this thing is supposed to look. Definitely helpful. Oops, I didn't save my part, so let me save that real quick. <clears throat> so I've got a nice 3D view of it. So what about the flat, okay? Back in the modeling area, with one click, we get the flat pattern. This is where some advanced users don't realize the quickest next step. I see time and time again, user after user, they'll generate this flat, they'll save their, their file. It's just a sub environment inside of each other. You can switch between the folded model or the flat pattern. You never actually leave the file. They're both nested together. Then 
people will come in here to the drawing environment, they'll place a view of the flat pattern, control your scale, blah, blah, blah. And then they'll start dimensioning it. Yes, you can do that. So I can throw down some overall dimensions. I can even dimension between bend lines if I need to, or from edges to the bend. You can also dimension or annotate each one of the bend lines. There is a bend note tool. You can either individually select the bend lines or you can do a crossing window through them and select them all. The bend notes show you the direction, the angle and the radius of that particular bend. The notations can be pulled off to uh, break it out like a leader arrow if you need to. In case your drawing gets a little bit too cluttered or the view is too tight, you can do that. And then a lot of people will think, okay, we've got this drawing. Now we need to come up here, do a save copy as, and we'll send it out to either a DWG to go into AutoCAD and clean it up, or we'll send it out to a DXF. And we'll bring that into AutoCAD or whatever other uh, package to clean it up. Yeah, you can do that, but there is a faster way. Because if you don't need the drawing and the title block and all the dimensions, if you don't need that for a documentation purpose, if your company standard is okay with you just sticking with the folded model and then the flat generated model, and you don't have to have that title block formal documentation, you can do this. In the model area, on the flat pattern, you can right click, you can choose extents, and that will give you your sheet size. Real easy, jot it down on a post-it, you're done, you're out the door. You can also right click and go to save copy as. You're saving this flat pattern as the DXF. You're bypassing the process of having to generate a template with a title block and dimensions and place views. It's simply going to output that flat pattern. So choose your file name, choose your format, DXF, SAT, or DWG, most commonly DXF. So I'll save that, then it brings up a utility to allow you to control some of the output options for this DXF. First and foremost, what format? You don't want to output it to 2018 when your burner is not even going to read 2018 yet, it's still reading 2013 or 2010. So you can choose what format to output the DXF. You can also have a post-process XML file to control some options. On the layer tab, you can choose what layers you see and what you don't. This is what a lot of people use AutoCAD to do. They'll go in here and they'll turn off the layers for certain geometry or they might even erase the lines. Uh, but in here you can say, well, we don't need tangent lines, we don't need, you know, whatever inner profile, outer profile, whichever ones you want to turn off. You can change the color if you want to get that detailed, even the line type and the line weight. So that will simplify that DXF to only give you what you need. Next, on the geometry tab, you can specify, okay, what happens on your spline curves? What's your tolerance, your offset distance for your spline curves? Uh, some burner programs are very specific on what they, what kinds of geometry they can bring in and work with, and others are a little bit more flexible. So you can say, well, let's replace all of the splines with straight line contours. You can merge all of those profiles into a polyline, which a lot of the programs follow nice and neatly. You can rebase or move all of the flat pattern geometry up to positive X and positive Y, so you have no negative coordinates in your DXF. And you can also trim out center lines at the contour location. <clears throat> All of this is a streamlined workflow. You're going to get these same options if you make a title block drawing, place views, dimensions. You're going to get this same output screen when you save that and convert it to a DXF. So why not save some time if you don't need that documentation, that formal presentation type documentation. Save some time, go straight from the flat straight to a DXF. Say OK, generates a DXF. You stay inside Inventor, keep working. Now, that's a lot of the basics of the sheet metal tools using face, flange, contour, flange, cuts, seams. Um, for these cutouts, one thing you can do is you can place in sketch points or center points. Of course, you can pattern these, you can dimension these, and instead of using sketch blocks, you can build this feature one time in a part, doesn't matter what part, just build this feature one time, 
extract it as an I feature that's over here on the manage ribbon. So you can extract it out and build an intelligent feature. And then back here on the sheet metal tab, you just use the punch tool and you can insert the punch at every one of those center points. So you get some punches pre-built for you out of the box, a couple of computer connectors and cutouts and keyways and things like that. Or again, you can make your own punch. Here's that same tab cutout that I programmed as a sheet metal punch. As soon as I open it, it knocks it in at every single one of those center points that I put on the sketch. Again, that's a streamlined way of doing this. Make that feature once, set it up as an eye feature, and then just insert it where you need it. All your sketching are center points. Uh, you can change the geometry if you have too many center points out here. You can deselect the ones you don't need. And you can also go in and you can change the size of it. Every one of these parameters, you can name them and set them up as a controllable value. So I can change the tab offset, the box width, any of these I want. I can either just type in a value or I can either even program a list of values for the user to choose from. So as soon as I click finish, I get all of my cutouts in the top end of it to secure the CD-ROMs from the top or from the bottom, depending on the orientation you use. So some of the more advanced um, command features in here would be something like if we look back at our workstation, we needed to create a rolled piece of ducting so that we're going to run some power cables and phone cables and things like that. What I have here is a simple, started out just a standard face. I added a flange on each end, and then I added flanges on top of that to kind of close it in and give a little bit of a gap to feed cables into it. And then I simply placed a sketch on this end face. Now I want you to look carefully at the sketch because this is the trick. The command I'm going to use is called it's called contour roll. And when you're sketching out the profile, you'll notice I did not create a closed profile. I see a lot of support cases coming in where the user is fighting with this. They'll want to go into the sketch and they'll want to use project geometry and grab every single one of these edges. The contour flange or the contour roll does not work with that kind of geometry. It needs to be an open outer edge or inner edge sketch, and that's all you need, that and a center line that you want to roll around. So with that in place, I can invoke the contour roll. You have control over your roll angle, your offset direction. This comes in pretty critical. In case you need to change, you can offset to the inside or to the outside, or you can even split it. <clears throat> Control over your bend radius. Uh, if you're rolling one direction or the other, some of the orientations can get off depending on your geometry if you're splitting that direction, because this could be the very first feature that you make. Doesn't even have to be attached to something. You could be starting with a contour roll. So I'm going to roll it out 62 degrees. And the next thing that comes up is maybe you need to put some kind of cutout on this bend area. Well, rule number one of parametric modeling, you cannot sketch on a cylindrical surface. You need a flat face, right? So maybe you think, okay, well, we'll put out some work planes or something like that. Yeah, you could, but there's an easier way to do this with sheet metal. I basically want to take that, that face right there and I want to flatten it. So using the sheet metal tools, there is an unfold command. Now we're not making a flat pattern, okay? We're just taking a feature, such as that contour roll, and we're flattening it out. We're almost, almost like you're undoing the contour roll, but you're not, it's still in the tree, it still exists. So what I can do now is I can generate my sketch, place in my center points, because I'm just gonna use the punch like I did earlier. Use my punch, insert that tab, not worried about changing anything. I've got my three cutouts. Now I need to re-roll that. So I need to bring that contour roll back into play. So there is a refold command, simply picking the base face and the edges to roll, and it does the contour roll back the way it was, and it gives you your cutouts that are cut normal to that curve. You might have been able to accomplish this with the emboss command. I'm not real sure. So it's the only thing that really comes to mind to pull this off. But using the sheet metal commands, very easy. You unfold, sketch, cut, refold, the day is good. Now, 
ultimately you're going to get that flat pattern so you create your flat pattern there's your flat of your contour roll <clears throat> another advanced shape for sheet metal would be the lofted flange so you're looking at a transition from one shape to another shape and most commonly squared around so we've got two simple 2d sketches your sketch one then you have an offset work plane and sketch two that's the basics of everything you need when i launch the lofted flange command i choose one sketch then the other sketch you'll notice it's much more simple than the actual loft command in the 3d modeling area you choose your offset direction for your wall thickness again it's just taking that sketch line adding a wall thickness so we could thicken it to the inside to the outside or we could split whichever way you want to do this then you have control for the output type so right now we're looking at a press break output but I can switch that to be a die formed and you'll notice the rounds get smooth <clears throat> if you choose press break then you can choose the cord tolerance facet angle or the facet distance this is where it gets real customizable so even though I'm choosing cord uh, tolerance here I can go into each one of these corner conditions and I can say well instead of using cord tolerance up here I'm actually going to change that and I'm going to use facet distance and I'm going to tweak this down to say three quarters so I get much more bends in that location so you can override from the global bend style and from the feature bend style and only focus on that one corner condition and only apply the bends in that area but I'll switch it back and say, you know, we're not going to change it. We're just going to go with the core tolerance on everything, make it nice and easy on the guy who's trying to fold this. So I'll click OK, and I have my sheet metal duct work in a sense, um, but I can't flatten it. It's still a 3D model. What I need to do to flatten this is I need to rip a seam somewhere on this. I need to open up a gap. So there is a rip command. And a couple of ways you can use this, you can specify a single point. So basically, if you want to rip that face and then you specify on your first rip point and then it'll just rip out an edge along a vector direction, you could do that. You could also say face extents, so it's going to cut out that entire face. Okay, for something like this, that doesn't make sense. Or we could say point to point. Okay, so my face, I'm actually going to rip out of the top face. Start point's going to be down here at the vertex. The end point's going to be back here in the middle. And again, it goes back to a gap size tolerance, which is related to your sheet metal thickness. When I click OK, I have an open gap in my sheet metal object. Now that I have an open gap, I can create my flat pattern. And you'll notice I get my flat with all of the bend markers. The other nice thing about this is when you're looking at the flat, you can see the bend order here in the 3D model. So Inventor is showing you based off of pre-programmed setup and and logical controls that the first bend you're going to make is this one then bend number two then three four so on and so forth if that does not fit your workflow out in your shop you can change that instead of that being number one maybe we need to make this guy number one just edit that bend order change it force it to be number one the sequence is recalculated you can change as many of these as you wish or you can remove that override and reset it back to the factory. So all of that is using the default sheet metal tools. Now let's look at third party applications. So I've got a Pro E file or I've got a SolidWorks file. <clears throat> You'll see these are native Pro E and SolidWorks. This is a native SLD PRT file right out of SolidWorks. So I'm going to open this up. And it's wanting to convert this. This is the uh, AnyCAD technology for Inventor. You can either choose a reference model or you convert it. I'm just going to go ahead and convert it, bring in the geometry. And you'll notice it comes in as a dumb solid. There are no features in this. Okay, it is a sheet metal component. Brings it in as a standard component, though. It's a standard IPT. You'll notice what commands I have at the top. Out at the very far right, you'll see convert to sheet metal. So I can take this standard part convert it to sheet metal and because it's a third-party conversion inventor recognizes hey you need to set up a base face on this you need to tell me where you want to start 
if you look down in the lower left hand corner you'll see the command area saying select base face so we're going to look at this and we're going to say okay we're going to choose this as my my source location my my base feature that i'm going to start with when i pick this inventor is going to measure the sheet metal or the material thickness and automatically program it into the thickness value for the sheet metal rules i don't have to do anything automatically sets it up I may want to come in here and tweak my rules, bend angles, things like that, but it grabs the thickness for you automatically. As soon as I say OK, I can instantly generate that flat pattern. So even though it comes from somebody else, we can still flatten it. Again, the original rule applies. When it's material stretch and the material is uniform thickness, everybody can flatten it. When it gets into non-uniform thickness, yeah, you're getting into some really advanced sheet metal engines. Those are specialized tools. We have access to that as bolt-ons on top of Inventor. So when something like that comes up, give us a holler and we can work with you on it and find the tool that best fits to work with Inventor for, for that situation. Okay, so from some last little bits to cover. We've got some sheet metal training. So if you saw some features and workflows in here that you want a little brush up on or some technology that you want to uh, learn more about, we've got some classes coming up. And actually I learned at the beginning of this presentation, the instructor for both of these classes is going to be Kevin Bosch, who's running, running our Q&A in the background. So you're gonna be in excellent hands with him. Uh, but we have classes coming up in January. These are e-training classes. They are online classes. Our online class content and workflow is the exact same as our live face-to-face -face classroom content and workflow. You are not watching videos. You're working with a live instructor, live interaction. It's just a convenience of you don't have to travel to any location. You can take it from your home or from your office. We also offer professional services and training for not only inventor and basic CAD workflow and advanced CAD workflow, but we also offer it for document management such as Autodesk Vault or Adept or Blue Cello. We have various document managers that we can utilize. We also have simulation services we offer the training and services for. That's NASTRAN or Inventor Professional, Dynamic Simulation inside of Inventor, or Simulation CFD for Computational Fluid Dynamics and even Mold Flow. So if you need any training needs, by all means, contact your Hagerman rep. We'll be happy to help you out. And now we'll go ahead and look at some of the Q&A. Kevin, how are we doing on the Q&A? You got anything to, to throw out at me and we can answer it? And there we go. It helps if I uh, unmute myself. Um, three to run by you. Um, minimum and maximum thickness for material. Um, I know I've done one inch thick, but I don't know if I've done anything over that. And I've honestly never really, I've done, you know, um, 0.03 thickness, but I've not done anything, uh, I don't know that I've done anything less than that. The minimum thickness I have ever done was 0 0.0001. The okay. The maximum I ever did was one and a half. I, I don't know okay. that it would have a problem going over that as long as your sizes are good, you've got a big enough footprint. Mm -hmm. um, it should not have a single problem with that. Yeah, and I don't know how many brake machines can actually do that. And then um, another good question, and I've I've kind of always gone to the manufacturer. Um, Carlos asked if there was any um, any literature about K factor. Um, I know that in my experience, a lot of the the uh, brake machine manufacturers would have a recommended K factor. Um, I don't, is there anything, you know, that really lists a default or, or a generic? I, um, I, I think Matt Webb has a section to cover K factors. It's been a okay. while since I looked at it in that area, but I, I think they used to have one, whether they still do or not, I'm not sure. I would go with what you said, go with the manufacturer. Uh, you might could try with the material supplier. They may know because all of this is going to be based on your machine and your materials. So it's, it's going to fluctuate a little bit. Uh, even using the same material on different machines, it could change a little bit. So my best advice for K-Factor is do some testing of your own to make sure that 0 0.4 
fits the bill for what you're doing. If not, change it to match the K factor that you're seeing out in the shop. Uh, I'll back up on the uh, previous question on minimum and maximum thickness. Um, the one thing that Inventor used to not be able to handle, that it can now handle, that was a zero radius bend. Right. Uh, used to, it could not do a zero radius bend in sheet metal. We had a, a local customer here in Knoxville that really needed zero radius internal corner or inside con corner, and Inventor couldn't do it at the time. Uh, now it's been there for, I don't know, three, four versions, I think. Yeah, uh, something like that. It, yep. It's been there for a while now. So, you know, you can set it up to have a zero radius bend. If you're doing a very thick material and you're getting a violation of some kind where it won't flatten, maybe look at your bend radiuses. Uh, if they make sense, if if they need to be a zero radius or something like that, tweak, tweak those kind of things. Um, but I've not seen a minimum or maximum limit yet, as long as your overall footprint uh, is big enough to allow it. Right, right. Um, let's see, Ryan asked, can we pass um, inventor properties such as material, thickness, part number, et cetera, to the DXF flat pattern? Um, I would think that would be something outside of, uh, like iLogic, would it not? Uh, you could probably do it with iLogic. Without iLogic, you could not do it with the save, copy, ass straight from the flat pattern. You would have to go through the long drawn out process of making the drawing, the title block, inserting the views, inserting the properties that way, and then save that out as a DXF. When you right. do the save as DXF straight from the uh, the flat, you don't have any options to uh, put anything in there. The, the, well, the only other thing you could do is you could put a sketch on there and you could put um, part number and uh, material, or whatever you need, you could put a sketch on the flat pattern and you can yep. even use the emboss command to engrave that. Not that your burner needs to pick that up, but at least that geometry would go out with the DXF. Yeah, absolutely. And then um, Mark Zimmerl just, just chimed in, and, and um, I had kind of forgotten about this. K-Factors talked about the Machinery Handbook, 25th edition, pages 1250 and 51. Thank you, Mark, for <laughs> awesome. that. Uh, awesome. Appreciate that very much. <laughs> Uh, let's see here, and this is this is a um, a feature or a uh, a tool that I'm not familiar with. A back clip bend um, is that would that be something like a hem? What it sounds like, if you've got a specific need like that, um, call us, contact us after the webinar. We might need to see an example or a model or a drawing to know. If it's, it could just be, it could be the same feature, just different t terminology in the software. Sure. So we would have to investigate that more closely. Sure. And then I had a question early on um, that I did answer about doing cardboard packaging design. Um, oh, yeah. Basically, can can it do it? And it's, uh, my answer was yes, it could, provided that you have the right material um, information put in. Um, and I think that is correct. Yeah, it, it is correct. Um, we have a customer in, uh, if I'm not mistaken, it's in Birmingham, and what they make are uh, the cardboard po uh, cardboard packages and boxes for inkjet toner cartridges, and mm -hmm. they use inventor sheet metal. And they actually don't even worry about the material. They just go with the default. They get the right thickness down because the cardboard is going to fold to whatever corner they need it to be. Um, they use sheet metal to lay out that box design for a cardboard box. Okay, and then Radu just asked another question about um, different thicknesses on different solid bodies. I know that we've got the new solid bodies tools in uh, in sheet metal, and I haven't played with the different thicknesses. Have you uh, Have you tried that yet? I've not tried it with different thicknesses. I've tried it with all the same thickness under the same sheet metal rule. I'm not sure how it would behave if you have multiple rules governing multiple bodies at multiple thicknesses. That's something we would have to test to see what it does. Okay, uh, let's see here. That's all I'm seeing for right now. Okay, excellent questions, by the way. Yeah, yeah, we got some some great ones. I I had answered uh, answered the majority of them. Um, let's see. Julie is having a little bit of trouble with getting some of the corner cutouts to work, and and Julie, that might be one of those um, 
get in touch with our support team. Let yes. us get on with you and see what's going on for you. And, and maybe we can give you some, you know, some specific guidance to what you're dealing with. And if you have any questions that either you didn't think to ask during the webinar or for whatever reason we accidentally skimmed over them and didn't get them answered, um, shoot those in to either your sales rep, they can forward them on to us, uh, or Ashley, do we have a, a, a general email for questions like this? I don't think we do, but I don't know what we've added recently. Well, um, um, if we have any kind of what they can do is if they think of something later, they could email or reply to the confirmation or reminder email from GoToWebinar, and we will get those um, here and then forward them on to Kindred or whoever needs to, it to be to, to get your questions answered. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Awesome. Um, let's see. That machinery handbook, um, that is – it's just a book that's been out for eons. I think a little bit of it is um, – is um, put into inventor on the designs tab. Is that right? Yes. Yes. Um, I don't know if all of that information is there. No, um, only certain sections have been programmed into inventor into the engineering's handbook. Um, last it's time probably I checked, an Amazon thing, I would think. Yeah, the last time I checked, the machinist the machinist handbook uh, is about a hundred dollars from Amazon, maybe a hundred twenty. If you get a book, you can also get a DVD of it. Um, or I'll sell you mine. It's collecting dust on my desk right now. <laughs> um, let's see. And Radu had asked converting a an inventor part with different thicknesses into uh, into sheet metal. And I'm assuming Radu that you want to go to that to a flat pattern. Um, I've always had some some pretty significant troubles with doing doing uh, doing parts that have different thicknesses. Yeah, um, it, it's got to be uniform. It, it's got to all be the same thickness. It can't be changing whether it whether it transitions to a different thickness or it stops and changes abruptly. Uh, it's all got to be a uniform thickness in order for the engine to flatten it. That's kind of a yeah. majority rule until you get into those real specialty high, high, high dollar uh, flattening applications that can you know, be bolted onto a lot of software. Right, right. And then Julie had mentioned um, she had the, the issue with the corner cutouts not, not working. Um, changing that in the folded model and then it doesn't, it doesn't um, update necessarily in the flat. Um, one thing I guess I would suggest, Julie, is to, if you can, if you, haven't, if you don't have drawings with your flat already, um, go ahead and delete the flat and recreate it after you make that change. Um, if you already have drawings of that flat, then that can cause some problems, certainly, because it would uh, it would blow those views out of your drawings. Yeah, that that's a good point. Um, a lot of times, if something isn't, uh, we'll say if the math isn't working out like it's supposed to in the flat pattern, the uh, flat pattern, because of changes in the 3D model, can sometimes get, I won't say disassociated, but that's kind of what happens. So we've had experience a lot of times where if you just delete that flat pattern and let Inventor regenerate it, it reruns all the algorithms from scratch and you get a good clean flat pattern. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And once again, Julie, I'd suggest getting in touch with our support and, and um, you know, we'd be glad to get on and, and kind of yeah. struggle with it, struggle with it uh, with you and, and see if we can't get it put together for you. And that seems to be uh all for the moment. Any other questions? Well, thank you everybody for attending today's webinar. If anything comes in, again, you think of it, like Ashley said, you can just reply to the, the confirmation email. We'll get to those questions as soon as we can, get them addressed and get back in contact with you if need be.